Well, hello there and welcome to 2024. And in turn, welcome to the 144th edition of DF Direct Weekly, our weekly discussion show covering the latest gaming and technology news. And uh, well, with the exception of CES just around the corner, there's not a huge amount of stuff to talk about, but nevertheless, we're here. And uh, joining me, first of all, John Linneman. Hey, Rich, uh, we made it 2024. Another year ahead of us, hopefully an exciting one. But yes. uh, I'm excited. Hopefully. Indeed. Is there excitement? Not lethargy? Well, there, there's some Haven't lethargy. Have quite blown away the cobwebs? There's a little bit of lethargy sprinkled in there, but also plenty of hope. Of hope? Okay. Yes. I would and, say uh, hope. Because, because it sounds you know, like a J.J. You know, Abrams Star Trek film. What do you mean? <laughs> <laughs> and, um, of course, Alex Battaglio. Yeah, yeah, I'm also full of hope today. Um, really? No, <laughs> but, but I, I'm I'm excited about 2024. I already started the year off quite well here in terms of video production. I'm all excited about what we're going to do in January. So yeah, let's talk mm -hmm. about it. Well, as an employer, the fact that you're excited about making work <laughs> is it work. Work. <laughs> uh, let's crack on with our first news topic and as usual it's not particularly a news topic more i think um, just general discussion about 2024 what we're expecting to see what we're excited about ces is just around the corner uh john is already salivating over some of the oled news that's been leaks ahead of the show um i'm gonna go to you first john and what you are excited about and uh, i guess we could start with the ces stuff Sure, yeah, we'll start with the CES stuff. So one of the first things to come out of this was that LG has more OLEDs in the pipeline. Big surprise, right? Every time you get to CES, they roll out the new OLEDs, and we finally got a look at what they're doing for 2024. So on the TV side, they have the four models, the, the M series, the G series, C series, and the B series. Uh, similar to last year, the M and Gs, the G4 and the M4, I guess, those feature the micro lens array technology uh, up to, I think the, I think it's the 83 inch now has this capabilities, which is the largest one they've done yet. So the MLA basically, uh, it does allow them to push a higher peak brightness than prior OLEDs. And it is basically their highest end panel right now. And I've seen this with the G4 three already and it's pretty stunning and looking at the lineup here it does start to make me think like should i should i replace the cx back there the the one with uh, richard's eye uh with uh <laughs> the the of the g4 <laughs> oh gosh <laughs> i'm wondering like and i'm i'm also curious if i want to go with this time i don't know could i fit a 77 inch g4 back there what oh my gosh John. <laughs> i don't know i don't know i'm thinking about it like it may well, the only thing keeping me back right now is that the the cx still has that like absolutely super high-end black frame insertion that is just gone uh yeah on the like it's still the bfi is enabled for 60 hertz only and the 60 hertz bfi is worse than it was on the cx so that's like the main thing that's keeping me on the CX for now is just because I do like using that with side scrolling games. So uh, we'll see though. Um, the mm -hmm. thing that's a bummer of course still is that the C and the B line do not get any access to this new technology, which means if you wanted to say buy the 42 inch C4 OLED, uh, I've been using the C2 here on my desk as a monitor and it's the best monitor I've ever owned. <laughs> and I think you guys have been using OLEDs as monitors as well. And I think yep, sure. you would agree that they're really good monitors. Even as a TV, mm -hmm. they work really well as a monitor. Yeah. Especially yeah, I... when paired with that LG Companion app. Have mm. you guys used that? No, not yet because I've been uh, keeping things very standard. I only recently just got the service remote to turn off all the eye strain oh. uh, stuff. So I'm a little bit lagging behind here. Well, but either way, new TVs coming along. The The thing that I'm really wondering about is that they were pushing this like, oh, with this new A11 chip, they'll be pushing lots of uh, AI enhancements, AI and picture enhancements. And they've done this right. before. I can't say I'm ex exceptionally excited by it, but I am curious to see if it actually does get to the point where it can actually enhance things, you know? Yeah, it's, like, it's been spotty, hasn't it? It's been very spotty in the past. And it's not... The problem is with a TV, of course, is that when dealing with the imagery displayed on it, it's all spatial data, right? It All it has is what's input into the HDMI port. 
So it, you know, the reason like <laughs> games with frame generation, for instance, they have access access to motion vectors, right? Uh, not not so here. So we'll see what happens there. Oh, I did forget to mention another thing that they've added this year is uh, support for 144 hertz input at the yeah. top end, which. I I don't I don't know why 144 was settled upon as a st- I guess it's like if you go it's 24 up from 120 so you still get that evenly divisible 24 frames per second playback yeah but for 60 hertz videos and just general usage I still think 120 is adequate but still any extra refresh rate there is a benefit uh but that's mm-hmm. not the only OLED LG has in the pipeline. They actually showed off, and while this is very, way, way, way too small for my use, I, I find it interesting. There's a 100, or sorry, a 1440p LG OLED monitor with 480 hertz refresh rate, yeah, which is the geez. fastest that exists right now. Uh, and you might be saying, like, what is the point of this, John? <laughs> like, what are you going to run at 480 frames per second? He's uh, well, yes, esports. But I'm actually thinking <laughs> more to e-sports. what uh, I've when discussing motion clarity with Mark from Blurbusters. He's continued to sort of, from what I remember, he suggested that once you get to around a thousand hertz uh, on an update for a modern uh, monitor like this, uh, with sample and hold rather than using sort of strobing, you can actually match the CRT quality motion, like basically perfect motion clarity. So. This could rely on things like frame generation, perhaps to get there, or some other techniques, or just lower end games. But either way, it's creating this headroom to finally really get that sort of motion clarity we've been craving natively without relying on any sort of additional trickery. Uh, so 480 hertz is about halfway there. Yeah, I know. And like right? here, that like the reason why that's good is because you you're gonna maintain peak brightness. You're going to yep, presumably yep. maintain all the goodness of HDR. Uh, I mean, the the one issue about all these things is, other than esports, the biggest thing actually isn't a GPU limitation. You could so, probably drive with DLSS 1440p in a GPU limited scenario up to 400 FPS, and a lot a surprising amount of games you I would, I would actually say, yeah. imagine. But the deal is, your CPU is going to get in the way extremely, extremely quickly. Um, and so that's the that's the one issue with my utility with these things is that they become VRR displays where you never hit the top level VRR, so you're never V-syncing, but you're always free, uh, yeah. you know, like free floating below. Which I don't know. I, I'm I'm kind of a fan of that. At the same time, I'm really not because like there's a you can still like Rich has seen this before. Like between like 240 and like 120 hertz, you can feel like a smoothness difference and see it. Uh, but like excess of that, it's like it's it's really hard to actually see usually for most arc movement. I mean, I, I tested right up to two forty hertz at four K um, uh, with a Samsung Odyssey G eight Neo mm-hmm. G eight, and right. um, yeah, basically, um, it's the differences. It's when you have these wild swings between frame rates that you actually notice the difference. So you know, if you suddenly go from like two forty to I don't know. Um, 120 you can tell the difference but if it's a gradual change in performance it's a lot more difficult to tell and uh, north of 165 hertz I struggle to tell any difference at all you know if your game is operating in a sort of 165 to 240 hertz uh, window found that quite difficult to actually tell any difference at all <laughs> but that's with like triple a fair when you're talking about esports i'm sure there's going to be people out there uh, up in yeah, arms about this outrageous <laughs> difference in uh, performance levels um, yeah but yeah that's where i'm sitting there i mean um i think ultimately what's going to happen is you know um probably will get to a thousand hertz and um it's going to be fame gen that's going to be basically yeah doing the heavy lifting to, to get us there. And um, I don't think anybody is. In fact, wasn't it the case when we were talking to AMD at Gamescom that, you know, uh, mm-hmm. Nick Nick from AMD was basically saying that the end game is to just match the refresh rate of the display. Right. Full V-synced refresh yeah. rate at that point, mm-hmm. which does actually make sense, I think, instead yeah. of r- relying yeah. on variable like uh, refresh rate at that point in time. Because then the, it simplifies a lot of things in the engine side where you yeah, don't yeah, have yeah. to necessarily... Uh, solve for certain things. Yeah. You know how much mm-hmm. time you have per frame, and it's yeah, kind of fixed. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. Um, what's this about an ultra wide five K, John? Uh, so I wanted to mention this. Uh, even though everything, thankfully, is shifting towards OLED now, 
uh, which, you know, that's great. But um, Dell also announced this ultra-wide 5K LCD monitor, and I wanted to highlight it because prior to switching to OLED on the desk, I was using a 38-inch LG Ultra wide, which was a 3840 right. by 1600 resolution monitor. And for the longest time, I sort of complained about the fact that nobody was making large ultra wide displays anymore with decent resolution. Almost universally, they were 3440 by 1440 or lower, which uh, I didn't think was good enough. Yeah. Because, and yeah. for gaming, that's totally fine. But for actual productivity work, for Premiere, like we use, uh, it's not enough. And Dell did just announce a 4K ultra wide monitor that is 5120 by 2160. That's perfect. And I think that's awesome because that means you can fit a full 3840 by 2160 image within the center of it, but you get more pixels on the side. Uh, it's going to look insanely sharp. It also has a peak brightness of 600 nits, which is surprising for sort of a desktop LCD. So while I fully expect it to struggle from the typical LCD problems, the back level, black levels are going to be poor, no doubt. The motion's probably going to be worse, uh, unless it has some sort of, you know, mitigation strategy for that. But I, you know, for LCD users, I wanted to highlight it for that reason, because it is something that I had been looking for in the past and i'm happy mm -hmm. that somebody finally delivered a monitor <laughs> like this because i still do love the ultra wide format and it is great it's just it was those low resolutions that were really killing it for productivity but man 5120 by 2160 that is a ton of pixels to draw mm -hmm. to drive but I, i'd love Sorry. to see what that monitor can do uh, and also worth finally mentioning, nothing too exciting here, but I guess Samsung also announced more OLED monitors, which is great. So some of their Odyssey monitors, um, it is a trio. It's the 49-inch curved ultra-wide. They've been doing those massive format, like mega ultra. Like, what is it? What is that even called at this point? I have no idea. It's, it's beyond ultra-wide. 32 ultra -wide. by it's, something, isn't it? 32. It's, yeah, it's like 32 yeah. by 9. Because it's basically yeah. two 16 by 9 screens side by side. Yeah, and it is it is, it is immersive, right? You've used one before, Rich, right? <laughs> yeah, I've used one. Um, yeah, it's not for me, though. <laughs> no, no, no. It's, though the problem guess, with them has always been resolution as well, because it's yeah, um, you get that wide resolution, but and that doesn't seem to have changed here because it's fifty one twenty by fourteen forty. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm also one thing I'm a little about about ultra wides and curvature is a part of it too. Is that when you play first person games, the the way FOV is calculated can lead to that extra information you're getting on your sides to being warped visually, mm. uh, which um, depending upon what you're into, that could both look not great and great because you know like you're looking at just a 2D panel and it's conveying a 3D world. That means the sides on a constrained FOV are going to start going like, woo, people are going to getting really tall and wide or something like that. And I, I've always kind of not liked the way it looks other than for just being peripheral vision. But if you have like a game that maps UI to the top right and top left where you're looking often, maybe, then you'll start noticing it a bit. And I, I'm always, I've never been a really huge fan of it, even though it is interesting, like you're saying, John. Yeah. Uh, also noticed, well, it does support some pretty high refresh rates, which is nice. Uh, it looks like the ultra wide one goes up to 240 hertz, and then they have a 26, uh, sorry, 27 inch monitor with 360 hertz. The big thing I'm seeing that's kind of a downer is that even though these are OLED displays, they're advertised for what I'm seeing here is HDR 400, which I yeah. don't understand because I don't classify that as actual HDR. And it can no. say with VESA display HDR true black 400. In, True Black 400. I just don't. True I don't. Th that actually kind of leads me on a just a tiny micro rant. Uh, w there was some discussion around HDR recently online, and I noticed that a fair number of people were down on it. And digging deeper, the impression I get is that a lot of people have purchased displays that claim to support HDR, and it's usually HDR 400 as it's called. Uh, and they're just not good enough at it. And there's mm -hmm. beyond the lack of brightness, they also have un uniform backlights without any sort of local dimming because they're LCDs, of course. Uh, at least here, this will be OLED, so you get proper black levels. So it should look better than usual. But 
it's basically not the true HDR experience. And I think you need to get to around 800 nits. And once you get there or above, and the more you go above that, it gets even better. I think it actually produces a, a pleasing HDR experience. But I think 400 has negatively colored uh, people's impressions of HDR because the the manufacturers basically don't explain it very well. And you think it's an HDR monitor, but in reality, it can't deliver the import, the performance you'd expect from HDR. And mm -hmm. I think they've simply poisoned the well on that and it yeah. should not be there. So <laughs> no, I don't on the flip like side. That. You've got steam deck, HDR, OLED, which is, you know, an exceptionally good. Oh yeah, that's true. On a mainstream device. That's great news. Ho that's hopefully we'll great. sort of, be a fixed Push experience people. for yeah. a lot of people to actually see what HDR is really about. Because when you see that in, in action, it is like a little mini LG TV in your hands. It's absolutely fantastic. Yeah, but that's a lot of uh, display talk for CES. Uh, there, John. <laughs> I mean, I'm sure yeah. there'll be a lot more news coming out. I'm sure there will be smart home stuff, vehicle-related <laughs> stuff, all, all the usual. Uh, of AI, I'm, I'd imagine. Oh, I'm sure we're going to be inundated with AI news any day now. Yeah, there's but... going to be obviously NVIDIA and, and AMD briefings, and um, that's the kind of the new gold rush, isn't it, from a technological yeah. standpoint? Mm -mm. I'm just yeah. waiting to see something interesting beyond um, upscaling that will apply to the gaming space. Yeah, uh, that would be nice because, like, I mean, we've had DLSS for, I mean, I guess ever since the 1.0 iteration, mm. but seeing deep learning applying to real-time visual graphics or even just real-time game design in a more... I'm looking at the finals right now, and they use machine learning for the voices, and I've kind of waffled whether I should even talk about it in the video because it's like you just hear voices, and it's kind of... They just sound like people, but maybe a little bit artificial. It doesn't really affect the experience too much. Uh, but I would love to see games where machine learning using stuff like tensor cores on rpc is actually doing something that is game changing uh but mm -hmm. think about the yes. voices alex that i found interesting is i've heard that the voice samples are actually somewhat repetitive still yes they are i and heard that, the same voice so that's the thing that gets me it's like <laughs> if you're not going to use actual voice actors then you should take advantage of the fact that the ai can generate whatever you need modality so like that, right the fact yeah. that it's just the same samples over and over again what's even the point uh, i guess like at that waste. point it's like uh it's maybe just like a concern of space file space because they're pre-recorded they're not using live ai to do the voice that'd right. be that'd be interesting but they're not they're using it just in the production um and that place maybe it's a file size concern or uh if you have too many barks and there aren't enough isn't enough could good information conveyed to new players then you're just like you know throwing out wild lines all the time that are just making people more confused i like wild so, lines I mean, yeah, they're they're great for some games. You but, got that uh, multiple on, uh, Japanese import, uh, John. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, okay. Um, well, I'm going to share some 2024 excitement of a completely different type. And uh, well, here's the thing: right? I've been talking for years about how cheap Xbox Series S is. Right? Buying new mm -hmm. is cheap, but you know, go on Facebook Marketplace, and these machines are like preposterously cheap. Um, and, um, you know, I've seen so many Series S's being sold for about £100. And I wanted Jeez. to look into whether it's actually real, whether it's just some sort of elaborate fake uh, to sort of suck you in. Why you choose a Series S to scam someone? I don't know. But, uh, well, there is, some, uh, there is a reason behind doing this, uh, because uh, my dad wants to get back into Flight Simulator, right? And, um, wow. the, you know, his PC is like 12 years old. There's no way he's going to be running flights in 2020 <laughs> on that. Or 2024 by that or point. You know? Yeah, exactly. But Series S, right, it'll, it'll do the job. And so here we are, my first exciting bit of news for 2024, a Xbox Series S bought from Facebook Marketplace for £65. What? <laughs> Yep. You gotta be kidding. F fully armed and operational. It doesn't it didn't come I think the reason it was so cheap is because it didn't actually come with a controller. I actually had to supply the controller. Mm, but even which costs so, as much as that. Yeah, I mean these things go for about 150, 180 on eBay. It's nuts. Can and, you use um, an Xbox One controller with a series sure, console? Of course, of course you can. Oh my gosh, Absolutely. then you can yes. get like the cheapest, <laughs> yeah. cheapest entry there. Dude. So it, you know, my sort of well, here's the thing. Right, I was driving. It was a forty minute drive to get the console, <laughs> and um, I was thinking throughout the entire uh, ride that this is simply too good to be true. It's too cheap, 
And then I remembered that the picture on the ad was just a generic Series S picture. And I was about halfway through the journey and I thought to myself, this this is going to be a 1S, isn't it? I'm going to get there. <laughs> You're going to get it. It's going to be an, an Xbox One S, not a Series S. <laughs> yeah. But lo and behold, it was actually a Series S. I peered inside the little uh, supermarket <laughs> carrier bag it was in and uh, there it is. And uh, yeah, that that was that's my initial bit of excitement for 2024. Um, <laughs> completely <laughs> on a tangent there, but um, yeah, I'm interested to see whether my dad's going to get back into flight simulator based on this, or whether he just wants a new PC, which would be a bit more problematic mm-hmm. uh, for, on a budgetary scale. At least. Gosh, though, that's getting <laughs> but you, you know, a series you S for your... that little. That's that's just I'm it's still, nuts, isn't it? That's amazing. Yeah, what a deal. Um, and the other thing, of course, it's almost like a victimless crime because you might be thinking to yourself, well, you know, Microsoft would probably want a new Series S sold, except, you know, they, they probably they still at best breaking even or possibly worse, losing money on Series S. So buying secondhand and if you go into like Game Pass or something, yep. they're actually up on the deal. Mm-hmm. It's a, a fantastic little machine. I'll tell you that, you know, one last thing about the, the, the Series S here, which I really like, is the fact that, well... It's a console. I mean, mm. look at these hulking things in the background there. <laughs> and, you know, the Series S is, is a, it's a console. It, it is physically a console. It's priced like a console. And uh, for those reasons, I kind of love it. Missing physical media. Just missing, <laughs> Just missing the physical media console thing. It's oh, yeah, it, the physical media. It's about yeah. half a console, but yes. <laughs> yeah. Okay, fair enough. Uh, yeah. Let's move on to some more 2024 excitement. Alex, uh, on the PC side, what are you what are you sort of geared up about? Oh, well, there's actually quite a lot of things here. Uh, one thing I want to talk about is we talked about the end of the year last year, um, the whole Star Citizen stuff. Well, uh, uh, one thing that 2024 is going to bring about is since they did demo it off and they've been testing it, um, our versions of aspects of it in their public test universe, as they call it, is going to be server meshing. And it's going to be probably the form of server meshing that is static, where different regions of space are just dedicated to uh, servers that connect uh, to this replication layer that the game has. Uh, And that is going to be interesting for me because I've been following the project since, I mean, when it originally launched in 2012, it wasn't actually this but at least since when they gave out the idea of what the the star citizen universe would be like that's when i thought like oh wow okay this is interesting and uh this is essentially like the fruition of the massively multiplayer aspect of star citizen and and that is looking to be a 2024 thing i don't think they've public road mapped exactly when server meshing is going to go online uh, but I'm expecting maybe in summer is what I would expect based upon the current like uh, way things have been tested. Uh, that would be like the second patch or maybe third patch of the year. Um, that's going to be awesome. And I think uh, beyond when they release uh, Vulcan, maybe that's two separate videos at this point in time. I'm actually super excited about this because I can finally show John Star Citizen. Yes. I, 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 I can finally we can do it. We can do it. Uh, we can do shenanigans too with a, like some sort of space org there. Maybe have like a hundred people spell DF on a planet surface. Yeah, yeah. Shenanigans. Hi-jinx. Space shenanigans. Mm, space hijinks, shenanigans. perhaps. <laughs> hijinks. Yeah, wacky yeah. hijinks. Um, I, I'm actually super excited for that. And then obviously, as the year goes on, Squadron is going to be pre- pre- progressing slowly. And if I can, I would love to go and uh, visit the team again, either in. Um, they moved to Manchester, or uh, maybe I go over to where John lives in Frankfurt and see what they're up to there too, because they have you know two big offices in those two cities there. And oh, yeah, uh, they got a them. they got a new swanky office down here in Frankfurt in a building that was just built in the last year or two. I, it it's nice. got to be sick. Uh, yeah, maybe I'll go. Maybe I'll go and visit them. There's a lot of stuff this year where it's like the early part of the year, and there's not many releases. In fact, I don't know when the next first larger release. Really oh, is. Alex, am you I forgetting su- something really you big? Sweet, you sweet summer child. There's, there's a, well, f- maybe for you, it's actually not that. Yes, yeah, like covering PC is a different. Just beast. to say, like we have that Prince of Persia game coming out. There's the Last of Us oh, Part wow, Two wow. remastered. There's uh, Like a Dragon Infinite Wealth. There's Tekken. Uh, all of that's happening in January, among yeah, other smaller it, titles. So, 
Yeah, yeah. Um, so, so yeah, for so for me though, like I don't think I'll be making. I know what you're going to be video. Making, uh, Suicide uh, yeah. Squad kill the Justice uh, <laughs> League February second. <laughs> Alex Pataglia, oh, you know, I, the no, review. God, the worst thing is the review. Alex Pataglia, the review, the game. Um, <laughs> yeah. Oh gosh, I forgot about that game. Hell Divers Two February eighth. Hell Divers Two looks interesting. Persona Three Reload. Uh, That's a, an Oliver thing. Uh, Tomb Raider One yeah. to Three Remastered. I'm going to cover that. Those actually looked good. That looks um, fun. That looks fun. Um, but yeah, I'm excited about that. In terms of things, like, so we ended out last year with a PC worst ports video. Oh, yeah, we did. And one thing I did like uh, that I saw in the comments, it would have been nice to see a best ports video. And I almost agree with that, actually. Yep. I almost feel like we missed an opportunity there in the video itself. Uh, maybe to have highlighted that because we came off of like the backs of Avatar which I really liked. And there were aspects of other PC ports. Uh, like I did like aspects of Ratchet and Clank. I mean, like you can't fault Nixies for like the menu and all these other aspects of the game. It's just like that launch was like a bit rocky and all these other. But maybe aspects. next year, Alex, the solution is just the best and worst PC ports. In I one think video. that's going to be what it is. And maybe most improved, which uh, is, it's kind of a bad category. I feel like I almost feel bad no, that we, we describe. We should, we should not be <laughs> well, feel bad. The games like there was games released in late 20. 2023 that we didn't include in the worst PC list like WRC, which, which uh, arguably or, or even a little bit Forza, like geez, you know, like yeah, there's, Forza there's, as there's, well, yeah, ooh, like where I just like, uh, yeah, I just feel bad, uh, a little bit bad about the most improved category, uh, just because it's like the game shouldn't be launching like that anyway. It shouldn't oh. need most improvement uh, winnings. Well, that, um, that was one of the feedback points to that video is why we why we included or didn't include games within that three month window. You know, we were kind of setting aside three months for them to get their to get their act together, basically. When, and it's a perfectly valid point. They should have their act together on day one. I agree. It's a val- at least, perfectly or, valid, or at least within the first couple of days, right? Yeah. Uh, so I, uh, I would change it but, to like maybe two weeks or something. Yeah, maybe. Yeah, make it make it something like you know, because like Callisto Protocol within two weeks fixed most of the, yeah. the core stuttering, as an example. Um, but hot off that, and hot off like the second. Um, second half of last year, I would say there's been a lot of uh, good awareness about aspects of PC ports that are bad. There's been enough. It's been like, I don't know, it's been two and a half, three years of hashtag stutter struggle at this point, I feel. I don't even know how long it is. It's a time warp, stutter struggle. I'm stuck in a stutter still. Um, But I think 2024 with the evolution of Unreal Engine 5, for example, and more titles that are going to be coming out using that this year and the later versions of it, hopefully not like 5.2, uh, up to 5.2, like something like 5.3, 5.4 would be great. 5.4 would be amazing, actually. I think we're going to see a good year, actually, of PC ports um, because we're over, I think we're over the COVID hump in terms of games that uh, had like quagmires there in COVID and they needed to launch at a certain point in time by a certain deadline. We're over the most of the cross-gen period where you could see you know just not the greatest priorities always you're gonna have a code base targeting things like xbox series x and playstation 5 and wanting them to run hopefully good there and then meaning good performance on similar spec pcs that's what i'm hoping for i feel it it could be this this could be the the great year for those kind of things uh avatar was a great way to end the year with a developer that was you know, pushing towards actually excellence in all the versions. And the PC version is especially excellent, I would say. It's the best version of the game. Uh, it runs super smooth. It's awesome. So I'm hoping that's what 2024 brings us. Uh, so that's some of my excitement for this year. I do have some other excitement. I mean, Rich has that um, Core i7 uh, 9, 990X? What, oh, what yeah, it? yeah, yeah. I've got to come over to Germany and uh, deposit it. Yeah, or hand. maybe yeah. I come over to the UK. No, we'll we, see what's going we, on. We want Rich to come over here so it can hang out with both of us. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, but I, I've also got, it's, can't see it right there, but right there on the shelf, there's also a, an Agea physics card. And based on some stuff on Twitter oh. recently, people are just loving hard you know hardware gpu physics yeah I think go- doing a return video going back at like some of the best hits of yeah, physics that's a great oh idea. that would be so good i mean i could do the gpu version obviously too as well as looking back as part of it at the original what a geo was originally so there's a lot 
there. And I'm, I'm excited for all those things. I was actually quite interested to see in the wake of your Arkham Origins video, John, that uh, there was a renewed appreciation for the smoke effects. <laughs> I think like many others, or like myself, people forgot about it. <laughs> Cause oh, it's awesome. I genuinely forgot that they had included that in there. And even though it looks a little bit silly at times, it's a very neat <laughs> yeah. effect and the type of thing we just don't see in other games. It's in Arkham Knight as well. Yeah. 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 Those, Tanks those. performance, whatever. <laughs> it was awesome. I mean, I think the one really cool thing about that uh, smoke effects isn't just that it's physicalized, but they actually doing like interesting shading on it too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like it's not just like sprites that are just nope. uniform color. So it looks interesting too. There's there's a lot of games like going back to. We I think I would love to look at Mirror's Edge again. I'd love to look at any of the games that you smoke. I think uh, it would be weird to go back and find. I do own Cryostasis. I just don't know where yeah, it is. Yeah, I played through that. I would like. I would love to look at cryostasis and stuff, yeah. Gosh. And, um, well, I'm going to talk a quick bit about uh, some of the hardware we should expect this year. I mean, Switch 2, I think it's a, it's a given. It's a given. Yeah. yeah. I'd say it'd probably launch with Metroid Prime 4. I agree. Just On cross-platform. Cross-platform. Cross-platform, I expect. Uh, yeah, cross-gen, I think. Um, yeah, cross-gen, cross-gen. The yeah. original right. Switch yeah. isn't going anywhere. It will, nope. it will continue. It will persist. How they market it, I don't know. When they market it, I don't know. Um, I'd expect to see something quite soon, actually, um, depending on whether it's going to be earlier or later in the year, I guess. Uh, excited for that. It's going to be really, really interesting. And um, just the concept behind it, you know, a, a Nintendo machine built on an NVIDIA piece of hardware that's got ray tracing, that's got machine learning capabilities. Um, it is so unlike Nintendo, I, I would say, um, mm -hmm. to, to actually make a machine like that with hardware like that. Um, and I'm really excited to see what they're actually going to do with those sort of features, right? I think it's going to be tremendously exciting. Maybe not in the launch window games where they've still got an eye towards the older Switch as well. And I suspect we'd probably just see, you know, the usual stuff there, like resolution, texture, increases, um, possible faster performance, whatnot. But, you know, still excited by that. Still kind of curious to see what form the machine will take, bearing in mind what we know about the chip inside of it. The question is how they're going to utilize DLSS, um, because I think we've kind of conclusively proved at this point that it has a computational cost that is very limiting on a mobile. Mm. Um, so, yeah, I'm really excited about that um, and equally excited about you know, what they're actually going to do software wise. And of course, the second thing, of course, is uh, PlayStation 5 Pro, which the is muted. The professional, <laughs> yeah, mooted for um, November, I guess, October, November. Um, how they're going to iterate on PlayStation 5, um, whether we're going to see some sort of um, bespoke Sony upscaling solution. Or bespoke, bespoke mm. anything in it, right? You know yeah, I mean? yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, so that's the sort of hardware side of things. We've got the, we'll talk about that separately because it's basically a done deal at this point. We've got the 40 Series Super happening quite, quite soon. I'm wondering whether by the end of the year we'll actually be on to um, RTX 50 series. Right, oh right. my god, yeah, it's going to have been two years since 4090 very soon. Mm. So soon yeah, enough. Um, yeah, there is sort of precedence between having you know um, two generations of cards released in the same year. 3090 Ti came out the same year as the 4090, I think, uh, pretty much. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I'd be interested to see whether they do that. Um, Obviously, there's a huge amount of rumors around the new architecture, and um, I just expect NVIDIA to double down on features, right? Because, you know, the performance, uh, I think, is is obviously crucial importance, but they've really managed to make features very, very interesting in the PC space. Um, so those are the three sort of hardware things that I'm really interested in. Um, there is, of course, the, the Xbox refresh, which if the um, FTC leak is to be uh, believed, it's the adorably all digital Series uh, X. I, I hope they've reconsidered that. Yeah, I hope there's been some reconsideration there because I just I'm just struggling to find the market for it unless it's noticeably cheaper. I guess it's. You know, I know they want to drive people to Game Pass. Obviously, that's a huge money maker. But I just feel like them leaving behind an entire 
part of an entire marketplace, basically, like the physical media marketplace, whether you're just buying digitally on Amazon uh, and getting your physical media through the mail, or if you're just going to a shop. Right. Like, even if that doesn't account for that large of uh, their sales, it doesn't make sense. I just don't understand why they'd want to, to cut completely it cut it off and to say, all right, Nintendo, Sony, you guys, you guys go ahead and have it all to yourselves. Mm-hmm. Right, because that's what that that's what that would do at that point. Because yep. I think then you know that shows where they're heading in the future, and the and if they discontinue the original Series X, then they no longer sell a console that can support the discs in stores. So there's no mind space in the even store bother, other like, than the console itself and the gift card for Game Pass. But, or whatever, but maybe you know? maybe the physical disc sales on Xbox have been so low that they don't feel the need to do it because they have pushed that sort of digital side of things. So. I mean, I, I w- they're not going to do anything without having done tons of research behind the scenes, right? So any move that they make is largely fueled by those dis- uh, by knowledge that they've gained over the years. So, mm-hmm. we'll, but we'll see. Mm-hmm. Oh, I've got one more hardware excitement uh, because, <laughs> sorry, you've got you, you mentioned Nvidia, but I'm actually all into Battle Mage. Uh, yeah, I'm we should very see something curious. there, right? We should be seeing Battle Mage this year. I think that it's actually on track. Um, and given the whole Meteor Lake stuff going on, they are pushing uh, hardware in new directions. So, ooh, what is Battle Mage going to be like? What what category of card will it be? They already have a really awesome feature set with Arc. It's just you know like the drivers. So. I'm curious if what else they're pushing hardware wise other than just a much larger chip that is more efficient uh, this time around. Will they also be like NVIDIA pushing features with each new generation? Uh, there's a lot of unknowns there and I am I would love for Intel to pick up in the pick up the slack in the places where NVIDIA and uh, AMD are kind of falling behind that is in price performance uh, and a viable feature set at in price performance and stuff like that because you know supporting AV1 supporting the encoders all these other things yeah excited to see what Intel's up to what about uh, their frame generation I mean we talked about that a little bit in uh, prior direct but um, we hadn't seen the presentation it landed pretty much where you thought it would though right yeah, yeah, it was. It wasn't actually. It was actually a, a good description of what it was in the presentation, uh, and it's much like I said actually in the last direct. Even though the original uh, description there was just like, it was not very helpful to figure out what was going on. Uh, as I was, they were just holding their cards to their chest at that point before the presentation was actually done. Uh, yeah, I would like that. I like that we're gonna see frame gen on Intel side. I'm curious if they're gonna roll it out to Arc. Uh, though, even though like the demoing obviously was occurring on Intel Arc hardware, I, I think. I, I mean, uh, yeah, I'd assume so. But it's just like the utility of things like that on Arc is is it depends, like because it re- it's going to require a separate iteration for a game, obviously right away. And right now, it's I think they still need to get XESS uh, one point two in the door uh, in a lot of games. And um, I don't know, we'll see. But at least for now. The future is looking extremely bright for uh, people who want extra added features to their cards and also making Intel an ultra viable mid to low spec category. Mm-hmm. Well, yeah, cool. I mean, at the moment, ICD Arc A750 is the de facto choice for a, a, a bargain sort of mm-hmm. entry level PC. I mean, they're yeah. selling that, that, that card for like uh, 180 to 190 dollars now. Like three times and the price of the Series S, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but when you think yes. about what that card is doing, I mean, it's up there with 3060, 3060 Ti performance in some scenarios. It's got XESS, it's got the machine learning silicon, it's got, you know, decent ray tracing performance. And, um, you know, the de facto choice before that was the RX 6600, which um, doesn't have um, particularly great RT performance, doesn't have any machine learning block. Um, so that would be my sort of go-to. I'm, I'm just wondering... Um, the extent to which Intel is going to continue. Well, they're obviously going to continue their um, GPU launches. The question is really um, whether they're going to continue to be ultra aggressive on pricing. And that's all going to depend on the extent to which people buy into it at the initial launch prices. Right. Because, <laughs> you know, I think uh, the A750's lost like a third of its price since launch, presumably because people weren't buying them, right? 
Yeah, that's yeah, but you know, they're, I mean, the, that's, they're that's, new to the game. It's absolutely. It's, it's going to take it. years to actually um, break into the market in, in the in, in the kind of scale that Nvidia and the AMD has. Mm-hmm. So yeah, interesting times there. Uh, any anything else on 2024 you guys want sure. to talk about? Uh, the games, baby. It's all about the games. <laughs> it's all we, about the games. Yeah, John Lennon and all about games. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, we ain't trying to do no geometry here. This is about the <laughs> games, baby. All right. So I did want to highlight some of the games I'm excited about, just uh, and also see if you guys are excited about them. For instance, well, it's the year of Skull and Bones. No. <laughs> <laughs> no, you, you, is it going to happen? Is, it? is, is this, is it is this the year of yeah, Skull sure. and Bones? You think it's going to happen at last? It's been like 10 yeah, years. It's, it's also the year of the Linux desktop, John. Okay. I don't know. <laughs> no, but, uh, you know, some big ones, obviously, this month, like a Dragon Infinite Wealth, man. I'm excited for that. Uh, there's Black Myth Wukong. Remember that? One of the first things we ever saw revealed uh, for new February, consoles. March game? When is that? I March? don't know when that's coming out, but okay. it's supposed to finally be 2024. It looks like August. Uh, oh, okay. okay. So I'm Later very curious to see how that actually turns out. Uh, Capcom has Dragon's Dogma 2, which looks pretty mm-hmm. sick. That looks good. Uh, Final Fantasy VII Rebirth, I'm pretty stoked for. Uh, curious to see how that goes. And it's also PS5 only, I think. So hopefully mm-hmm. it leaves behind some of the issues, some of the things we've seen in the past with uh, the original remake, like the door. Although it would be funny if the low-res texture door made a guest appearance in this new game, <laughs> just somewhere. Like maybe you find it in like a garbage dump or something. A news broadcast, I don't yeah, know. Just something put like it that. somewhere. Uh, oh, Warhammer 40k Space Marine 2. 2, yeah, it's September. I hope that's good, but it looks mm-hmm. it looks conceptually awesome. So I'm excited for that. Mm-hmm. Uh, Penny's Big Breakaway from Evening Star, I'm like super stoked for. Uh, I'm trying to see if I can do something special for that too. That's the Sonic Mania developers. Yes. Their first yeah. uh, original IP. So that could potentially be amazing. And on the indie side, also the Plucky Squire. Remember that? Yeah, I do actually. That, yeah. that looked stunning. That's actually finally set for 2024 kind of release and sega stuff as well like i think like the new shinobi crazy taxi uh streets of rage jet set hopefully jet set radio they haven't i i mean i i'm hoping that they're 2024 don't know for sure but uh i think they might be so we'll see that Mm. then there's stuff like star wars outlaws yeah anyone's late year right late year apparently well, initially it was Disney. Uh, Disney said it's late 2024, but they've since gone back and just put 2024. But I suspect it probably is. Well, I mean, late it's, it feels like a it's holiday a, game. It's a holiday yeah. game. People love Star Wars for the holidays. That, but that's another uh, <laughs> massive game, I believe, right? Yeah. And so it should uh, be good. they did an excellent job with Avatar. I feel uh, mm-hmm. perhaps more than anybody expected, right? Yeah. I think we can largely agree that. Avatar turned out to be a pretty darn good game and probably the best open world thing that Ubisoft released in like a decade. <laughs> it is interesting, at least in terms of exploration. It's sure. very interesting that aspect. That is true. That, I, I, I think it's also cool that Ubisoft has that new Prince of Persia game, which I mentioned. You know, it's a side scrolling yes. sort of. Yeah. I'm curious to check that out. Uh, Hellblade 2 is another one that I'm very excited to finally see because that was the first ex- new generation Xbox game announced, I believe. Yeah. Before the console was even a thing, perhaps? Or? Yeah, that, that was quite interesting going back and looking at that reveal because um, there wasn't really anything known about Unreal Engine 5 at that point. No. Nope. And I don't and, think the developers and, and, really knew about it. And, and yet it, it nope. manifested like an Unreal Engine 5 game would look <laughs> before it transitions <laughs> to Unreal Engine 5. Yeah, I, I, I don't know. I do expect it to be an absolute technical showpiece, though, based on what they've what what it seems like they're doing and yeah i I do have some excitement for that it could could be a very good looking game which is cool uh of course i'm just looking at my list here of different things anything you got one if you mentioned final fantasy yeah i did yeah yeah i'm curious about tempest rising that's also this year oh dude Um, yeah i played the demo of that that's sick, Command dude. and Conquer esque, uh, yeah, very yeah, much yeah. so styled after Command and Conquer UE5 RTS, uh, made by 3D Realms, who are now going through a tough time, a really tough time. They've been embraced. To, they've been embraced, and uh, they're just 
just oh my god they're shedding people like crazy yeah it's, i it's hope these awful. games are okay I hope the games are okay. I hope the people land in uh, yes, better yes, jobs, that's actually, more secure I, that's jobs. That's more important, actually, is that I hope the people um, are okay. Yeah. Uh, but that, that game, the, the, the demos were very promising. Uh, the, the tone and the visuals are awesome. Yep, there, there's yep. a number of actually indie RTS games that are going to be, that are looking to target this year. I think there's another one called, oh gosh, I forget the name of it. Maybe it's called Dorf. It's got like a weird German name, but it's got like this crazy art aesthetic. It looks, it's very much so like the, like the voxel terrain era of CNC, uh, but with like the 2D uh, fake shadowy look to all like the the, the units. It's right. incredible looking. Uh, I forget the name of that off the time. I think it's Dorf. But Dorf. either way, um, that one, that one also has my eye. There's, Indie RTS has just kind of exploded over the last couple of years because I think there is a lack of them in the market. And people who also just want to play single player games. Uh, RTS for a while went away from single player yeah, due did. to the intense esports StarCraft. Everyone yep, needs yep, to be yep. StarCraft. Uh, everyone a, needs to be a MOBA. To be fair, though, StarCraft 2 <laughs> did have a really good single player mode that like that is one of the awesome. shining beacons of that game like it is it's, it's incredible awesome. that they managed to have like all those um great single player campaign stuff in and, and it's still a really good looking game if you go back and play it starcraft is, is. two these days you would be shocked how good it is it's only the issues it's dx9 also the uh the command and conquer remastered thing that you covered i played through that yeah. on pc and man that's freaking awesome! What a love letter. <laughs> That's to awesome. The original we haven't Commander we Cogger. haven't seen anything from them in a while. I think Petroglyph's working on something else right now. Um, so I don't know. We'll see what they're up to. But also, you've got all the the Age of Empires expansions that are coming out this right. year. I think um, I think they're going to be also doing a big expansion to AOE four. Um, well, we'll see. We'll see. I mean. Uh, there's a lot going to another be game that's kind of I'm cautious about, but I hope it turns out for them is Stalker two. Oh yeah, of right. course. Yeah. So obviously mm-hmm. those guys have been through some some <laughs> and uh it seems like they're finally going to reach the finish line this year. So and I hope yeah. it, I hope it turns out good because the demo we played at Gamescom it was very rough, right? You remember Rich, we played that. Yeah, sure. Yeah, and yeah. You could see the potential there, but it was also it felt like this like super pre-alpha like incomplete kind of thing which it was. Uh so <laughs> it was a, it was it was a triumph it was there but it also demonstrated yeah. um how much work still needed to be done and i st- think at, right now they're still sort of trying to target the sort of q1 or early yeah q2 we'll see that'd be nuts which, if they hit that i don't know i think the yeah. main thing with that demo that was missing was just sort of the uh the facial and the dialogue sort of animation uh which is something right. that's been very prevalent in the trailers but when in the actual demo that was playable, everybody was extremely stiff and it felt like placeholder stuff, which it very well could have been. So my feeling is that the trailers, what they've shown is what they've been targeting. And I hope that they can reach that goal. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Well, there's a couple of other titles. I'm not sure if they're 2024 or not. I'm not sure if they've even had release dates announced, but <laughs> um, uh, Light No Fire from Hello Games. I'm curious as to oh, yeah. what's happening right. there. I keep seeing advertisements for it on YouTube, so it's oh, got to be a oh. 2024 game, right? Yeah. yeah. You'd, you'd, th- you'd think so, and um, No Rest for the Wicked from yes. Moon Studios. Yes. It's com- it apparently yeah. is coming in 2024, which I'm Like early 2024, actually... like March, really? maybe? I oh, think wow. it's, it's coming. Excellent. Oh, wow. Okay. I, I yeah. don't know for sure, but I think like I think it's mm. targeting the first half of the year, and that, that looks freaking... That trailer was stunning at the Game Awards, I thought. Yeah. Really, really well mm-hmm. done. Yeah, and um, the, that's coming on PlayStation as well. So it's you know not an OE situation where it's sort of just Xbox and actually yeah, did come to a Switch. Private Division is the publisher, I think. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Interesting stuff. Yeah. Any oh, more for any more on twenty twenty four? Vampire oh the Masquerade Bloodlines Two, if you remember, was yes. supposed to have been a launch game for this new generation of consoles, right. uh, and the gameplay they showed prior to that, I thought looked excellent. Like very much the kind of imsim experience you would have wanted from a sequel to that original. Uh, it seemed very faithful, but then for whatever reason, it feels like it was canceled and stripped away and maybe sent off somewhere else. So I have no idea. I need to refresh myself on what happened there, but it feels like they've essentially restarted and built something else. And I hope they actually don't stray too far from what they were doing and turn it into something that, you know, fans of the original may not enjoy, but we'll see. We'll see. I'm I'm right. interested to give it a shot. That's for okay. sure. 
Mm-hmm. And then obviously, you know, as I mentioned earlier, I know Alex is totally excited for Suicide Squad for the Justice League. <laughs> Kill that is, Justice that a, League. is that a is that a video where we do like a uh, cross platform play? I feel like we should do we should that. probably I, do that. We absolutely should we do that. Probably thing. should do that. Uh, also, um, two more to mention um, there. So one of them, obviously coming very soon, is Tekken Eight, which yes. is mm-hmm. shaping up very well. And then there's also Grand Blue Fantasy Relink, which mm-hmm. is a cool looking action R- RPG. I actually saw this at E3 like, like five years ago uh, <laughs> when it was being developed by Platinum Games. And since then, Platinum was dropped off and it was retooled dramatically. And it actually looks pretty interesting. And I'm curious to mm. try that. And that comes out February 1st. So that's another one hey. that may be covered soon. And that's. I mean, we could go on and on, but we should probably stop here. Uh, there's yeah. a lot of there's a lot of stuff coming, and probably a lot of things that haven't been announced yet. So, That's oh, true. RZ, the Jewel of Faramore. <laughs> okay. I wonder who. I wonder that's, who's in that game gee i don't know that's yes that's the game that i was uh involved with helping on uh the design with uh my good friend seth uh coming mm. out in february the game how is, can you guys forget about done. plumbers oh plumbers don't wear ties Dude, that's a march 2024 edition. release right right and i'm even one of the trophies yeah and i think rich is <laughs> Maybe, maybe involved. I in think this Richard game? is somehow in some somewhere. There's a reference somewhere. Maybe that's maybe. Yeah, just silly. I think basically uh, an offhand <laughs> comment I might have made at Gamescom has been turned into some sort of uh, packaging Luke. endorsement. We'll see. I hope so. <laughs> that would be amazing. Uh, uh, so uh, but yes, best. That, hey, uh, that stupid thing, man. I what they've done with it is absolutely nuts, and I'm very curious. I'm very curious to to see the final. Thing come out but yeah mm. Fair <laughs> okay let's move on to our next news topic okay so um we're actually recording this before nvidia uh announces its stuff for um ces 2024 mm. but at this point i mean everything to do with the new nvidia rtx 40 series super lineup has indeed le- uh, leaked <laughs> and um yeah i'm kind of curious as to what you guys think of this because um well, let's talk about the sort of um, uh, the, the baselines here. Basically, the 4070, the 4070 Ti and the 4080 now have or will have um, likely by month's end um, upgrades, super variants. And um, I mean, video cards here has actually just broken down all of the specs and, and revealed what the improvement is against the existing cards. And... Um, Probably the least exciting one in terms of specs is the 4080 Super, where it's, you know, right. the, 40, the 4080 Super was using, I think, the AD103 processor, mm. and it was almost fully enabled, but the 4080 Super gets the fully enabled version, a bit of extra um, clock, uh, some extra CUDA cores, and apparently the fastest ever GDDR6X memory. Um, I think the, the the key thing about that is going to be not so much the performance level because it can only be a slightly be a slight boost over the forty eighty, but right. basically it's all about the price. <clears throat> and um, if it's anything more expensive than a thousand dollars, then it's basically DOA thousand dollars. You kind of reach what you'd expect for price versus performance against the forty ninety. Um, Finally. Yeah. Finally, yeah, yeah, because like this was like the weird redheaded stepchild card where the 4090 (laughs) looked like a great buy even at its like near 2k price, right? (laughs) Uh, just because the 4080 was so tragically 4080 is a great GPU, but the price is a great GPU, the price just didn't make any sense, so yeah. Um, let's move on to 4070 Ti Super, um, 10% on um, cores, bit of extra clock massive memory capacity upgrade it's gone from um, 12 gigs to 16 gigs it looks as though it's moving on to ad103 from ad104 so you know it's a a, a larger chip as well um more memory bandwidth as well because you know a wider bus i think it's 256 or i'm not sure 100 it's, it's, it is going to be a 256 bit bus, yeah it I'm is going to sure. be the the 8103 etc yeah so that could be potentially quite interesting all of, it's again it's all about the price really isn't it and then you've got the 4070 super which is uh, looking quite interesting actually a 22 percent increase on core count 
a small increase to boost clock, but the same amount of memory. They've upped the TDP as well. So it should be quite a decent improvement over the 4070. And I guess they kind of needed that because the 7800 XT was, was rather good, right, mm -hmm. from, from AMD. Question is, again, price, what they're going to do with that and also what they're going to do with price for the 4070 because it's it kind of, I don't know, organically the prices have dropped on the 4070 already. Um the question is whether they're going to make that official. The question is whether they're going to be more aggressive with the existing 4070, which we understand remains in the in the and circulation, play. and um, whether they're going to do more against the 40, sorry, the, the 7800 XT, which is always going to have more memory, right? So yeah, interesting stuff there. I'm curious what you think about this, Alex. It's, it's basically, I think, you know, 4070 Ti, 4070 Super look like good enhancements to spec, but it's got to be met by decent price points. Yeah, for me, it's mainly about the price here because I think actually all, like you just said with the 4080, in like it is a good GPU if you don't look at the price and that it, then, <laughs> then it's not a good GPU anymore. But if the prices are going down, if the if the increased performance is maintained at a similar price, like with that uh, TI, not with the TI Super, sorry, with the 4070 Super, um, that is the one that's like the 20% CUDA core advantage. Um, then you're actually looking at that upper, I mean, what do you even call that kind of price range anymore? I don't know what you call it, but you're looking at that price range being uh, a better buy, uh, more in line with what you saw in previous generations where, for example, like 3090, if that... 4070 super comes into 3090 territory instead of trading blows with a 3080. Yeah. Uh, then you're looking at what we saw in previous generations where the top end card would move down to the 70 tier, like 2080 Ti going down to 3070. Um, you know, that's, that's a pretty historical thing that happened, well, at least yeah. since the Ti cards have existed. Uh, so that is what I'm excited about. I'm, I'm, I would like that, uh, I mean, the extra, like, it depends on really, like, what people are targeting to. That There's that, that TI Super, I don't know what the price will be, but, like, if you are targeting 1440p, I'm not sure it's a very interesting GPU necessarily, but if you are uh, doing, quote-unquote, 4K on a budget, it's not really a budget if it's this expensive, but <laughs> it, 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 if you're doing it on a not 4090, not 4080 budget, maybe then that extra frame buffer for 4K gaming. The 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 one thing about NVIDIA's last generation of GPUs and also, I guess, the 3000 series is they've just cheapened out so hard on uh, VRAM tiering. Uh, like you, you can either get too much, arguably, or you get too little and the, the the midway point is somewhere where amd is just way ahead with the 16 gigabyte on a lot of cards or even the 12 gigabyte on cards that are competing with eight gigabyte ones so um i i like to see that they actually did make headway and i think they they locked themselves into this awkward position with how they stratified the chips this time around uh like i'm very curious after this what happens with the 4060 series over time um, because that 4060 Ti is just weird. But it's the 16 gigabyte version. Uh, but then you have like the 4060 Ti and 4060, which I don't know, they occupy a, a weird space in my mind where I have trouble recommending them because I'm worried about eight gigabytes. I don't think it means you get a bad experience, but I want to always ensure people get a good experience. So yeah, I'm just curious if they're going to do anything with that later this year at some point. Because I think know. in this point of the generation, the 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 60 product should be as good as a console, right? It really should. And um, your 70 product should be a lot better. And we're kind of getting there with the the 70 products, except that the 70 product is quite expensive, right? The 4060 right. is actually an okay price at 299, I think. But the the issue is, and I've been thinking about this a lot. I mean. The 3060 is not that much slower, and it has 12 gigs of memory. Doesn't have frame generation, um, but you know there are other solutions coming. You know, like FSR3. That's, that's that will come good eventually, right? I think FSR3. It's not quite mm -hmm. there at the moment. I mean, I mean, you're going to be looking at the um, the the hacks that are happening now, the mods that basically enable yeah, um, frame generation. Videos. 
mm-hmm. because a lot of people are, you know are looking at like cyberpunk 2077 and you know they're on their 3080s and thinking well maybe i can get path tracing working on that and that's an entirely viable you know thing that could happen if um if 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 fsr3 is modded in and and working correctly so yeah there's a lot of stuff going on there i mean i'll be interested to see what's going on with the 40 series supers it's just i think that we're looking at sort of mid-tier tweaks um as opposed to um addressing the oddities like the 4060 having too little memory and the 4060 ti what's happening with that 16 gig variant you know um there were price adjustments but it it needs to be like a, a 399 or even a 350 card. In my oh, opinion. yeah, completely. Yeah. Mm, yeah. Ah. I mean, it, for, you know, and again, the 3060 versus 4060 conundrum, more memory versus better features. It's it's a tricky one. It really is tricky. It's one that the consumer really arguably shouldn't have to make, I feel. Exactly. Yeah. I mean, the, yeah. you know, the, the concept that a, um, a 40 series part should be outspecced by a 30 series part in any dimension that has a meaningful impact on the gameplay experience is kind of nuts, isn't it? Especially for the core tech purpose of ray tracing, which is all t- what the RTX brand is really about in a lot of ways, other than mm. DLSS, like where you could maybe be uh, memory outcompeted to use RT on a 4060 versus a 3060, which I think is actually something that could occur in targets, uh, games targeting, stuff like Series X. So... Yeah. I mean, John, you're sitting there with your 4090. You're happy as, as Larry. Just you? laughing. As all of yeah. us are, I mean, I think, right? We're all, we all have right. those. Yeah, so. sure. But I, I, John, I, do you I enjoy using the le- XTX. No, like I, I, do li- I do like to see what other... One? I do enjoy seeing what other graphics cards can do because the 4090 is stupid expensive. It costs a ton. Yeah. But uh, the, the thing is, though, with the way GPUs are currently, I still feel like... It, the GPU is good enough at this point. It's the problem is the CPUs and everything else uh, when it comes to gaming <laughs> performance, right? right? Like, like I feel like the speed at which new GPUs are coming out, like oh, we're talking about all the fifty series coming up and all this. And you mentioned that features have to be big, and I think part of that is just down to the fact that the CPUs are being left behind and <laughs> these GPUs are getting so fast. It's like, it feels like there's Sonic tapping their foot, just waiting for the, the CPUs <laughs> to catch up. Right. Like it is that's the bottleneck the case, in most yeah. games these days still. And, uh, and which, you know, the rise of frame generation obviously is designed to mitigate that somewhat, but that continues to be my struggle is CPU. Everything's it's always CPU. It just can't keep up. And I think, you know, faster graphics cards released later this year but even these mid-range ones that we're talking about and the supers and everything i think they're they're going to be more than good enough uh for, oh. for any rig out there and that that will it will basically eliminate for the most part the gpu as your major bottleneck in a system yeah for a good for a good amount of time for, for a while for like most titles that don't use path tracing that's Correct. like literally it's like literally the only frontier where the gpu starts to struggle at precisely this point in time. 4090 is just so ridiculous and there's in not that many path traced games right now right it's cool yeah. i'm happy that they exist but it's still relatively rare and i don't expect it to become that common outside of games that nvidia themselves gets behind to push that technology right i agree so yeah. okay I don't know. That's that's basically my thought. GPUs are in a weird spot because of that. we've got a couple of uh, supporter questions about this. Um, oh, this one nice. from Perfect Underscore Organism. If you uh, if you ignore the supers on the horizon, I can pick up a forty eighty for as low as nine hundred and ninety nine pounds in the UK. Quite a bit off the MRRP, but obviously not as great as the thirty eighty at launch. Any thoughts about its place in the market at that price? Well. You know, I, that's what I'd expect the 4080 Super to, to launch for. So mm-hmm. I wouldn't be buying that. I'd be expecting the 4080s to be end of line and um, sold off at a discount. So, right. yeah, basically wait for the Supers there. Uh, this this question, which uh, which did make me chuckle from uh, Diego Elve. Hey, DF, hypothetical situation. Alex needs to recommend a new gamer, a GPU. The RTX 3050 6 gig, and we'll talk about that in a minute, is $179. The RX 7900 XTX is also $179. Does Alex still choose the 3050 because it has DLSS? 
so I mean to troll I would say yes but to, to be extremely realistic I would never ever recommend a 6 gigabyte 3050 unless you're really desperate even versus it has nothing to do with the AMD card at this point it's just like I recently got uh uh, helping my brother get a laptop for someone that he knows and there's like a I don't know what it was it was maybe like a 40 54 gigabyte GPU in there and I was just thinking like what is this GPU like it it it, it, it barely for the modern gaming like you can barely do much with four gigabytes like a lot of games are going to have serious issues so it, it's basically a productivity GPU at that point uh, well, you know, the, the point is, though, that the 7900 <laughs> XTX will run games I know. I, well, native the, resolution I'm just, higher. I'm than... trashing these cards because I don't like them in general. I wanted to trash the 3050 because I don't like it. But in this case, yes, 100% the 7900 <laughs> XTX. You could run a game at like four times the resolution, regardless of DLSS <laughs> with native TAA, uh, even with things like better ray tracing. Like, it's a no brainer. <laughs> Uh, well, let's talk about. It. I mean, it's coming soon. The thirty fifty six gig it is essentially a done deal at this point. I think there've been enough rumors and leaks, and it looks as though Nvidia is finally killing the entire GTX line. Uh, the sixteen fifty, which they've sold millions of those things. Uh, I'm not sure why. Um, <laughs> yeah, right. It, it, <laughs> it's it's going, and RTX 3050 becomes the new baseline. Apparently, a $180 price point for that. Um, I've put here on the docket. It's a bad idea, but it's actually thinking about it a good idea for Nvidia, isn't it? Because you know the 1650 proved that they, you know, as long as there is a cheap GPU out there that is by NVIDIA, people are going to buy it more than the competition, even though the competition could be a whole lot better. If you think about what $180 does with an RK750, it, it will annihilate the 3056 gig. <laughs> It'll destroy it. The thing that also <laughs> yes. annoys me about the 3056 gig is the concept that they've actually <laughs> reduced the specs on the 3050. <laughs> Which, as if which, it wasn't bad enough yeah which already was you know I, when it came out I was expecting it to do 2060 performance and it didn't even do that no and that was a bit of a disappointment to me so to take that and to reduce the memory which will in turn reduce the memory interface which will in turn lower performance that's just that's just kind of not great you know it's, it's not very good at all mm. but at least budget gamers do have better options it's just you know the kind of 1650 proof that people are just going to buy the 3056 gig anyway which is a bit <laughs> depressing but, but there we are i wonder uh, if it, it is sometimes market penetration like you just can't get an amd gpu at a local retailer somewhere that has cards of this you know i'm talking yeah. about like surely surely people countries. are buying yeah. online for the most part these days have you seen yeah, any of these on facebook marketplace rich well these <laughs> ones aren't out yet so uh, <laughs> no no no, no I mean, but uh just graphics cards Oh, there's there's a there's a huge like the, amount like of them. These, I've got to say, Alex, deals? there was I did see a, a deal which I was kind of tempted by. It's just that the outlay was too much. Mm. It was forty classic GPUs. Ooh, whoa, interesting. In a box for five hundred pounds. Oh, but it's is it? Did they, was there a listing of all of their names? Nope, just uh, pictures of them. So I could see oh. that they were oh. kind of from the Hawaii and uh, AMD generation. Maybe some. Um, uh, of the corresponding NVIDIA ones at the time, which would be Kepler. Mm. Yeah. Early Kepler. I've always been kind of curious about, like, I don't know. There's there's some GPUs of that era that I wanted just to see how they fare out over time, like four gigabyte variants of the Kepler yep. series. Yeah, seven, Those are 17. ones I'm always curious about. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Gosh, you know what would rule, guys? If we were able to set up, like, the DF PC Gaming Museum and just have oh like God. every generation of PC games represented with appropriate hardware and like all these different graphics cards and like really discuss CPUs. all the history about yeah. them. Isn't this Alex's flat? I mean, if you look <laughs> underneath this desk, which I dare, dare not, shan't, I will not show this. There are almost, there are 12 different <laughs> PCs around here of different nice. eras. The whole idea is like, I, there's eras that I'm more interested in than others because the, the, the hardware variation is much higher. Like as soon as you get to like, 
like past 2012 it's a little bit less interesting because cards are just like dx12 class and uh they just run everything better over time uh but then you like get below that and each year is like a different version of dx and a uh, different spec almost uh, yeah. it gets crazy like around the the turn of the century to say that i mean phrase. yeah i'm i'm it big into nuts. 90s graphics cards i've got yeah. like 30 of them or something at this point like all the <laughs> yes. different variants i think it's i love that stuff it's so fun yeah. 90s gpus because like you thousand gpus like you say alex the difference in the way that they even like present their rendering is so different from graphics card oh my graphics gosh card yeah that it's actually interesting to see it especially when you deal with like ap special unique bespoke apis for that card right and the it, fact that he's like, oh, yeah, this this Matrox car, this G400 <laughs> had special, you know, like the uh, environmental bump mapping, of course, back in mm -hmm. uh, Expendable. Stuff like that, which was absolutely just wild to see uh, at the time. I love it. There's also crazy things that you almost get a little bit of today of when you were talking about that GTX uh, 1650. is just cars with of the same launch year, but with extremely stratified uh, features. Like... Uh, the like 2000s era ATI would launch cards all the way from DX7 up to DX9 in the same like host of GPUs. Can't even imagine that today. You can't even play some games on that DX7 GPU, but they do it. They do it. It's crazy. Let's not forget the GeForce 2 MX series, the MX card, the GeForce the MX 4 series. MX, which was the most uh, egregious Garbo. use of naming I've ever seen. <laughs> It's a GeForce 4. It, Why not? Yeah, it's got to be good. 4. Oh, wait, it's an MX. We have GeForce 4 at home. Yeah, exactly. I was just thinking, actually, uh, we've, we've had the, um, obviously, with NVIDIA, we've got the TI, we've got the Super. Now we should have the Egregious. The Egregious. egregious. <laughs> yeah. And they brought back TI. I mean, that was a thing for That's a true. while. They yeah. brought back T TI. I, I'm sorry. <laughs> TI. I'll what never about, forget What them. about the GTS? The RTX GTS <laughs> yeah. TI. Uh, gtx ti quadro i don't know what what are some other because before gtx there was gts like the geforce 2 gts and everything mm -hmm. that's what i'm thinking of mm. we need we need a 5090 egregious 5090 egregious <laughs> <laughs> what if they brought back the, Do it. the voodoo the 3dfx voodoo name somehow for like a i don't know like a series of uh if they could turn it back into a prestige brand somehow, I don't know. Uh, they they could boutique this. They I would have love, all the, I would love the to specs, see that, right? They could FPGA it. They could do whatever they want with that, but they don't. Um, they should bring back Banshee. They should bring back... Should they? Yes, because... <laughs> it's better than the than the Rush, at least. <laughs> it's better than the Rush. The, Banshee's, the Banshee is better than the Yeah, the, the Banshee's okay. Uh, so look, um, on the Intel side, they, they've got code names that correspond with letters of the alphabet, right? So um, yes. when we get to the fifth generation, it's got to be Evil Commando. Evil Commando. <laughs> Still my favorite name. Yeah. Mm, okay, enough of this nonsense. Enough. Nonsense. Uh, let's move. Let's please move on to the next news topic. Okay, so uh, this looks like another leak from CES, and um, it's been announced that MSI has a handheld, a PC gaming handheld, that's going to be revealed at CES. And um, details have leaked. I'm looking at a video uh, card's uh, news story about this. It's called the MSI Claw. Oh, yeah. I, man, This we were just talking about the Evil Commando, and I'm just like, I feel like the spirit of those old graphics cards' names has been embodied with the rise of these portable PC handhelds. <laughs> They've the got to find the edgiest stuff. The Legion. <laughs> the yep. legion My you goodness. know it's, it's man i love all those names they're going biblical here. and they've done it here again the claw the claw <laughs> versus the legion i always think of the the the, the toy story movies when i hear the claw oh, oh my god this the only name that sounds like just I, the steam deck the steam deck name is like extremely perfect perfect yeah, i think it it's great it's so good it's what a great name Oh man, the whole marketing around the Steam Deck is excellent. But yes, is, anyway, yeah, they, they MSI. Right. I, you know what? I like MSI a lot now because uh, they've. I have the motherboard I purchased for this PC is MSI, and it is the most solid motherboard I've 
head in like, <laughs> a, long time. like a decade. It actually works. It actually yeah. works. It doesn't <laughs> blue screen. My goodness. <laughs> the bar is yeah. so high now. <laughs> it doesn't randomly drop USB ports. It's like, oh, oh my gosh. gosh. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, returning to the, to the claw. The um, you know, I have to admit, first of all, there was a leak of just the silhouette and I wasn't particularly excited. It's like oh, <laughs> another PC handheld. Yep. And we've got a, a, a massive deluge of them now. And most of them are based on the same components. So you kind of, you know, the, basically the Radeon, sorry, the Ryzen 7 yep. 7840U. And there is going to be an eighth generation Ryzen counterpart, but apparently it's very, very similar. Um, so, but you know, the thing that's interesting about the LSI is that it's, it's Intel inside, mm-hmm. and right. uh, the Core Ultra Seven One Five Five H SKU has been mooted for inclusion in the Claw. It's going to have uh, sixteen cores and twenty-two threads, which is a, a ton of performance for a handheld. Oh. But it is split between P and E cores. I think it's just six P cores on uh, Meteor oh. Lake. Is it, um, is it, would it be wait? Would it be four here because of uh, the amount of hyperthreading? Or wait, actually, am, am I doing the math wrong here? How how many P cores? You say um, six. I believe that the uh, the Core Seven Ultra has six. I might be wrong. Okay, yeah, you're probably yeah, yeah, right. yeah. It says on the video card story six cores, six P cores, eight E cores, two LP cores. Okay, lots of cores, <laughs> uh, but it's using um, Arc Alchemist architecture, eight XE cores, CPU. Uh, sorry, uh, clock speed goes up to two point two five gigahertz. Mm-hmm. Um, this is a twenty eight watt processor, mm-hmm. but it's going to be obviously running at much more constrained uh, power limits for battery life. Also, thirty two um, gigs of RAM in here. Wow, that that is going to be an option apparently. That's, um, that's cool. Mm-hmm. So you'll be able to boot Alan Wake <clears throat> 2 on it. Yeah, yeah with no issue, <laughs> unlike that. Because there are problems with uh, Warg Ally. Uh, because it requires... Alan Wake requires 16 gigs of system memory plus um, whatever GPU RAM you've got. Well, Rich, the problem is you got to edit the autoexec.bat and config.sys and <laughs> yeah, free up just enough... Do a high sys memory. Uh, did you have enough yeah. conventional memory when you tried it? That might have been the issue. <laughs> that could have been a problem. Yeah. Obviously, no. <laughs> In this case, no. Yeah. So, I mean, we'd expect it to be revealed and and surely released quite imminently. I mean, Core Ultra 7 is uh, is due for release very, very soon. I think there might even be some laptops out there already with it. It says Core so, 1 2024 in this little chart here. Okay. So. Yeah, makes sense, right. Um, so I guess this is basically going to be an Intel versus AMD graphics face-off at this point. Um, this is great. Yeah, which is something I'd love to see love in, the, in the in the laptop <laughs> space. And maybe it is the time, right? Because obviously there's been driver issues with um, Arc up until this point, but they do seem to have got a lot of their act together on that front. So the Trio are going to be in the handheld space this year. You've got all yeah. these yes. AMD-based systems. You've got the MSI Claw with Intel, and then you get the Switch 2 with mm-hmm. NVIDIA. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Not, you know, mm. absolutely. <laughs> I yeah. know, right? So I don't really know what else to say about this other than, well, bring it on. Let's take a look at it. Um, the form factor looks very wog like It's actually, and it's kind of bulbous looking where it's like bulbous. the edges sort of fall off a little bit. It reminds me of mm-hmm. the the second generation Atari Lynx. <laughs> I don't know if that's I'm a sure good thing that or a bad thing. Primary, but... primary motivation, yeah. <laughs> bulbous. Uh, when, when you describe things that are good, they're very rarely bulbous. <laughs> but w- uh, the other photo where it's sort of like more not just presented with a fake background looks slightly better. So mm-hmm. I, mm-hmm. I, I'd I, say I, what, what we need is an RTX 5090 bulbous. <laughs> yeah, it's just a big sphere no, dude, the, dropping uh, here's PC. the real deal is you got you know people carry around these uh, external battery packs for their phones yes. right so what if and what if i propose to you an a wearable graphics card where it's like a man bag or a backpack that you just like wear and it's got it's, you put your gpu of choice in it and then you just run like a single cable to your portable pc and you have to be connected to your pc and i'm it, sure there have been like vr setups that are exactly like that Right, like, <laughs> there where, has been. Wear the graphics card on your back. Yeah. Why not? I, so for this one, I'm actually just curious how e cores uh, are going to essentially change anything here for Intel in this space, uh, because the issue Oliver Rich has talked about it a bunch is like the power constraint. 
you may have better CPU, you may have better architecture, but when you go against the Steam Deck, you end up just kind of losing. Uh, you're not as efficient as you would think mm. due to the architecture itself and just the power constrained nature of it. And I'm curious if e cores actually are like a huge game changer for this at all in this space. I don't see many um, benchmarks online of people just running things only on e cores. Uh, what if E stands for Evil Commando? If then they'll be they'll win. <laughs> the market goes to the claw at that point. But I'm I'm very curious to see if that does change anything. The one thing I I have had like a less than positive ex- experience with my e cores when I was using the 1200K because I felt that developers uh, and Intel uh, either it was it had to do with Mindshare, either it had to do with the way games were programmed, or it had to do with what Windows was doing. But it was so often the case that a game would just not run as well with eCourse enabled. And yeah. um, that isn't a big deal maybe in the in the smaller space where it's more about power. But on dedicated desktops, it was less than a positive experience for pr- when you're not in productivity mode. So, Well, you know, I'm just wondering whether it might be... Uh, a good thing for whatever software the MSI Claw has to actually just have the option to disable the uh, efficiency cores completely. I was wondering whether for older games it might actually be worthwhile to disable the P cores, but then, you know, that'd be running at such under such little strain anyway that I doubt it would make too much of a difference. Yeah, right. Six P cores, assuming there's 12 threads there, that's that's great for gaming. So I think, you know, that's probably the way forward there. Uh, we just have to see. I think it's all going to come down to the efficiency of the graphics, right? Because um, efficiency is somewhere where Intel hasn't been great on the graphics space because, you know, the architectures are, are quite old. Got to remember that Alchemist is, was delayed significantly. Mm-hmm. And even on 6 nanometer, it wasn't really a, a, an efficiency monster by any stretch of the imagination. Nope. So, yeah, I guess the jury's out until we actually get to see the product. But uh, I just... I'm just happy that it's not another AMD one, right? That you've, you're spoiled for choice with AMD in, in the handheld yep. space. And um, yeah, interesting just to have a bit of competition there, but it might well be the case that AMD remains the default option anyway. We'll just have to wait and see. Uh, any more to say on this one before we move on? I guess that's a no. No. Mm. <laughs> okay, let's move on. Okay, so John, why don't you talk us through this one? Because um, we're going to be talking about Prey Dog's Unreal VR Injector, which is getting a lot of uh, positive notices on social media. You've given it a go yourself. Yeah. First of all, what is it? What does it do? Uh, and is it great? The idea is that it leverages uh, Unreal's uh, features and capabilities in VR and applies it to every game. So the idea is that, well, conceivably every game, not even at, UE5? Pre- yes. I tested RoboCop with this. It does work. Oh, wow. And mm-hmm. the idea is that this helps translate things like the way controls work into actual motion controls and it allows you to customize the experience to match like a dedicated VR game. And it does work, but I did find that there's some still some caveats and it's not like a, I think this is an amazing base to build from and it's going to lead to some remarkable polished up mods. But the idea is that you run this program uh, then you start your VR game of choice and you select, you then, once the game is running, you select the game from a drop down and hit inject. I initially had issues getting this to work and it turned out to be because to be due to Windows, Def- Windows Defender, like trying to project, protect itself from injecting or something. I don't know why, uh, but I, I worked Gosh. around that. It's fine. And once injected, it just basically works as a VR game. You'll notice it shift to sort of the, a different view on your desktop, uh, a new menu pops up, which you can toggle on and off by clicking in the two analog sticks by default. Uh, you throw on your headset. Uh, the initial setup or just getting a game running in general is a little fiddly, I thought, because you have to interact with this front end interface to enable it. So if you're using, so in my case, I'm using the Quest 3 wirelessly. So I would connect it up uh, just to simplify it. I actually use the Steam Link function this time, but it does work with other methods such as the Oculus Air Link and uh, virtual desktop. But there's a caution around virtual desktop suggesting you can only use OpenXR for minor problems. I need to explore what that actually means in practice. But mm. the, basically the issue is, is you got to look, you, you put on your headset, you get things rolling, and then you have to take off your headset, walk over to your PC, 
or try to fiddle with it through the virtual interface in the headset uh, to get the game running, go back to this app, select it, inject it, and then you go back into VR. And it, it's not, obviously, it's not going to be as seamless as a dedicated VR game. And that's acceptable considering what it's doing here. But once you put on your headset and the game's running, yeah, you're presented with a very configurable menu system that allows you to do all sorts of typical adjustments, including like some a simple example. By default in one of these games, so it maps it out to the Oculus Touch controllers, right? A normal FPS game, you would use the right analog stick to turn the camera. And that's still true in VR. But smooth turning in VR doesn't feel great. It can cause motion sickness. This allows you to turn on snap turning just from this menu instantly. You can also mm. determine the facing of... It can determine the direction of your character movement based on your choice. For instance, if you want head movement to determine your direction of movement, you can enable that as well. And I like that because you can just look around and the game moves where you look by pressing up on the analog stick. Uh, and there's all sorts of options for mapping in the motion control stuff and it can get a little bit finicky and you do need to pay attention to things like settings and resolution more. When I first loaded it up, it was rendering like 4K per eye or more or something like really high. And with RoboCop, for instance, which is a UE5 game, uh, the frame rate huh. was not good. It was not good. Uh, I will no. say that the the time warp, the head translation stuff worked really well. <laughs> so like head movement looked smooth, but like actual game character camera movement was like, I don't know, 40 to 50 FPS, which feels really bad in VR. Mm -hmm. But... I was able to dial it down and get it running fine. I also tested Returnal, uh, which is a third-person game. I wonder if there's a way to do it in first-person. I don't know if you'd want that, but as a third-person yeah, game, right. it actually looks really cool being able to control your character in third-person while playing VR. Uh, that's That can be very immersive, That's cool. I would say. And yeah. that, that seems to be the case in general. If you're willing to fiddle a little bit, you can get some really neat results out. And it feels, I'd say, like maybe 70 to 80% there as far as uh, behaving like an actual native VR game. Maybe even more in some cases. But I think with some additional modding, some additional streamlining and continued improvement on this, we're looking at an extremely compelling way to bring Unreal Engine 4 and 5 games into VR without native support. Uh, oh, another one I tried was Juson which had mm, wow. it took a little bit of fiddling but once you get that going like the sense of scale you get from those environments it really works in vr it's it's That's pretty awesome. stunning to see so yeah i i wanted to try i haven't tried it yet but i was curious what if you run like say tekken 8 demo <laughs> in vr mode are you like looking at a little stage with the characters on it that actually could be neat there was psvr support in tekken 7 if you remember it was yeah, very limited recall. very limited but it, it's funny so i'm really excited that this exists i think it has a ton of potential and it seems like the community has latched onto it in a big way and there's just profiles being made tons of customization happening people are going nuts with it and the potential is super high Okay, good stuff. So now let's move on to supporter Q&A. This is the part of the show where every week on our Patreon, we ask our supporters to come up with a bunch of questions and they rarely disappoint with some absolute bangers, as they say. And um, yeah, we choose the best ones or other the ones that we feel could provide the most informative or entertaining answers. And we're going to kick off with this one from Kurtz, which actually comes from um, the call for questions for last uh, directs, but Alex wasn't present for that. Oh. Anyway, the, the, the question is this. It's my impression that Alex's optimized settings used to maximize performance while staying roughly visually equivalent to max settings, often touting some big performance gains alongside minimal loss in fidelity. But with these last few videos, it's been more about tuning the game to mid to low end cards and visual compromises are made more readily. Claims of maintained fidelity are largely absent. My question is, was it your approach or the games that changed? Did you always target this tier of cards with compromises simply being unnecessary for cross-gen releases? Or has your target changed, making such compromises inevitable? Alex. Well, I think if you look at what um, the last couple releases have been about, um, where that's been more explicit is they're games that offer very high-end options. Mm -hmm. um, so if you look at Alan Wake versus uh, 
I mean, just look at Alan Wake. Like uh, for that, I targeted. I did show a thirty seventy and a. I think after the fact, I did a twenty seventy super. Maybe in the video too, I showed it briefly running at those settings. Um, <clears throat> and there I was saying like, no, we're not going. You can't approach max settings in this game visually. It's just not possible. This path tracing. Um, so you get what you you get the best as you can and i think that's a little bit the gen moving on i also think it is a little bit um you know the type of game like if a game has path tracing you are not going to approach max settings at all with optimized settings uh there's too big of a gulf so you got to try and get the best you can possibly get without the max look uh and that's what consoles do uh, some of this does have to do with the way the, the GPU market is right now. Uh, like the current most popular GPUs are around that like 3060 level. And if new games are coming out and they're also coming out on console, I think it's a really good idea to give people an understanding of what the console experience is like and if they can try and get it or best it on their GPU hardware. It also gives people a great sense of whether or not the game is optimized. We know over a course of a uh, number of titles how, where these console versions tend to lie on, in the spread of PC GPUs. And if a game is an, a, a massive outlier in one direction or the other, it's really good to be able to point it out. So for now, my uh, as long as like the most recent releases, yes, I would say I have been targeting a slightly lower end experience as of late. Uh, but it's mainly due to the type of games and also where we are in the current space of this generation. It may change when I upgrade my GPUs very in the in the near future in that PC because right I've been doing the 2070 Super for so long, 2060 Super for so long. Uh, what happens if I go up to a 4060 or a 3060? Is it going to be very different? We shall see. Yeah, I think I'm moving to 3060 and 4060 is actually a really good idea um, simply because, well, first of all, the 30 series is so popular i mean yes. top of the steam hardware survey um, but it does have 12 gigs of memory 4060 is going to be you know whether we like it or not it's going to be the the, the next class class of cards to follow the 3060 it's just inevitable really um, based on on the way the market has behaved and mm -hmm. then we have the eight gigabyte limitation but we have the extra features um yeah i would expect the 3060 to be pretty much up there with your 2070 super um yes so but you know it would be more relevant to the audience to actually feature a card that a lot of people have they have you know 2070 super not so many people have it by by comparison the other thing i think we should be bear in mind is the whole nature of the games themselves is that like it or not playstation 5 is the de facto target platform these days and that's where the developers are basically going to be looking for the best bang for the buck so producing um, optimized settings based on that class of hardware kind of makes sense i think it's unless the developer is doing a really bad job profiling their game <laughs> it's gonna yeah. be better than what i could arguably do in the course of a video because they're taking months to to you yeah. know, get these things I think down. to be fair, when you did the Alan Wake 2 RT video, you did have optimized settings for path tracing, right? Yeah, I did. I did yeah. throw, I said like, you're going to do 60 if you do the shadows. And if you turn on anything else, it's a 30 FPS targeting experience on that class of GPU, which I considered PT capable, which was the 3080. Um, and then the 4070 was actually a lot better. So that mm -hmm. was an interesting case. Yeah. So like when I started working at DF, it was towards the middle-ish tail end of the xbox one generation yeah. and at that point in time the mid spec cards that were out were such 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 a big upgrade over what you could get on console and especially yeah. cpu wise that like it ended up that optimized settings ended up being usually just like a little bit of a tier below the ultra setting and then now it's changed because there's been so many introductions to the graphics market and a new generation of consoles has started. So it is, it's not philosophical. It's, it's not something crazy. It's just the market's <laughs> evolving. Um, yeah. Yeah. I mean, Alex being philosophical. Can't Never. have that. <laughs> no. <laughs> uh, let's move on to the next question. This one from Sloth. The original Dark Souls 2 pre-release trailers had a much greater focus than the final game on using darkness as a gameplay mechanic, with the player needing to find light sources to proceed through otherwise pitch black areas. With the increased adoption of ray tracing this generation, do you think that a contemporary dark fantasy hack 
and Slash game could now be viable using the interplay of raid-faced light sources and darkness as a core part of the gameplay, rather than raid-facing being primarily aesthetic? Or do you think developers will be too concerned about potential complaints that the game is too dark by people who <laughs> might be playing in suboptimal lighting conditions, similar to the criticisms Doom 64 and 3 had on release? I'll go to you for, for, on this one first, John. It's an interesting idea, right? And I'm kind of thinking back to the original Alan Wake where um, right. I just think that the lighting mechanic could have been used to produce much more interesting gameplay because it was that good. Yeah, I agree with this. Uh, but before talking about that, I wanted to mention Dark Souls 2 specifically because they talked about those pre-release trailers. I was fortunate enough to play a build of Dark Souls 2 way pre-release at Gamescom one year that still had right. more of that stuff in it. And it was quite different compared to what actually shipped. Uh, so that existed, and it was running on a PS3, no less. I was a PS3, PS3 dev kit, so I, too, was disappointed that they decided to change the whole way they did lighting in that game. Uh, which is why, you're right, now that we have more advanced lighting features, I think it would be neat to see developers leverage them more uh, within games. But as he mentions... Doom Doom 3 specifically, uh, a lot of people don't seem to like that. I thought it was great in Doom 3, uh, but I can understand why people may have been frustrated. Um, so that's tricky. You want to see it done in a way that's interesting, actually take advantage of the properties of light, but you have to do it in such that considers that some people may find that confusing, annoying, or ch just difficult. Uh and also take into account other displays. Like, I've talked about this recently, but because of the prevalence of LCDs, dark games became difficult after Doom 3. After about 2005, yeah. LCDs basically became the de facto PC monitor, and even on TVs often. Black level's very poor, you just get backlight bleed. And as a result, dark games like Doom 3 look really, really bad, because any area that's bathed in darkness is just backlight. Uh, and we saw at least a decade of games just move away from this as a result. Now we're back to HDR displays. We got OLEDs everywhere. You know, even LCDs have gotten much better in this regard. Uh, new technologies allowing really dramatic real-time lighting. You don't have to rely as much on baking anymore. So I do think there's a ton of potential here to really push things, and I hope to see it. I just don't know specifically how it would be used without thinking about it a little bit more. Yeah, for for Dark Souls, it really was the navigation mechanic, like actually seeing where you're going, and uh, like you said, it could be annoying for a lot of people. I think, I think the reason why they dropped it was performance, probably back then, because uh, I do not imagine the PS3 was holding up very well. Uh, John, do you, if you recall, uh, with that uh, Dark Souls two demo, I remember it running just fine in the demo. Okay. It was it was completely. Okay, from what I recall, I did not find was it. Was it actually on a triple? It was on a real triple dev kit. Uh, mm -hmm. And you could tell because it had the X and B menu and the system was sitting right there. Mm -hmm. And I don't know why. I think that I feel like that area must have been some sort of like vertical slicey kind of thing that they ultimately changed when the entire game was built a different Came. way somehow. Yes. Uh, I, I want to see it again because I, I can't remember just how close it was to those original trailers, what changed, but I I recall thinking like, wow, this it was that specific section that we always saw in those comparison shots where you go down and down those steps and, and it's the, like super dark awesome. and you yeah. have a torch and the torch is casting shadows and I remember being really impressed by that. Uh, and then obviously yeah. the final game did not have that. <laughs> yeah, I mean, yeah, like... I love that kind of stuff. It's just a matter of making compelling gameplay around it. And I think um, with the baseline of current gen consoles being capable of uh, RT to a certain degree, it, it's totally possible. I don't know if it's going to be in the dark fantasy genre, though. I think... Um, I don't know if it's the the genre right now to be pushing tech necessarily. So he mentions Doom 3, and actually one of the coolest things recently, I've been playing the Doom 3 Quest version right which translates mm -hmm. everything yeah. into vr that allows you to use the flashlight and your weapon kind of separately and mm -hmm. it, it makes being able to separate those two and you know use your flashlight while also using a weapon completely transforms it and made me think mm -hmm. oh yeah like real-time lighting in vr is amazing because you have so much more control over it and it just feels natural 
because you're exploring these dark environments. And if you had a real flashlight, you sort of behave in the game as you would in real life. Right. And it, it's, I think that's compelling. Okay. Good stuff. Well, let's move on to our next question. This one from aliasing anonymous. Well, that's a good name. <laughs> Uh, watching the worst PC ports of 2023 video has me wondering what is each team member's bigger, biggest graphical quote unquote pet peeved despite uh, besides stuttering. Wow. Uh, well, Alex, didn't you just do a video last year, like 13 things oh, yeah. that yeah. PC ports are getting wrong? Yeah, but so like, you, a gra- like, like a pure another, graphical thing. You got another 12 to choose from, I guess. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, I, I don't know. I guess pure graphical thing. Um, another pet peeve of mine is uh, non-steady camera movement. Oh, probably. Um, so like if the camera moves uh, at an uneven rate or a rate different than what the output refreshes, then I I I also right. have okay. like so huge you, lurches. You pointed stomach. that out in Jedi Survivor and Hogwarts, right? That's basically where yeah. there's a stutter, which is not a stutter. <laughs> from a rendering yeah. perspective but the camera is moving out of sync with the update of the renderer yeah and it, it happens a lot in games i think uh more so than people would think and it's something that developers wouldn't even necessarily notice because it's not a performance metric okay hmm. interesting uh john mm-hmm. um i would say i would venture poor scaling in any game that uses pixel art that is a huge pet peeve of mine yeah. Uh, where the pixels Matrix. are either poorly poorly filtered, uh, too blurry, unevenly scaled, and this can manifest in many different ways. Uh, there was that news recently about the upgraded Sega Saturn version of Symphony of the Night, which got major fixes, takes advantage of the 4 meg RAM cart, but unfortunately they still couldn't fix the inherently poorly scaled background tile art, which is baked into oh, the no. assets. That can't be fixed. Uh, whereas other games, a lot of modern games, when they do retro collections, the way they scale the pixels to full screen just doesn't look good. Uh, it, either it's a bilinear filter, bad CRT filters that don't look correct, uh, you know, shimmering due to uneven pixel scaling, so many things. It's It feels like... I This is when we discussed prior to uh, the holiday where maybe I should make this like manifesto video like you did, Alex, but for like mm-hmm. retro or classic style collections because there's certain things that you just shouldn't do when releasing a game like that. And it keeps happening uh, and it's very mm-hmm. frustrating. And mm-hmm. I want to highlight the developers that have gotten this just right because there's some that really nailed it and those are the models we should be following. So, okay. Yeah, fair enough. I mean, my pet peeve, I think it's basically games that lock to uh, the Windows resolution, Ooh. Windows desktop <laughs> resolution. Yes. That is gigantically <laughs> annoying because, you know, I've got a 4K display, but, you know, maybe I don't want to play the game at 4K, you know, and I can't change the <laughs> I can't change the resolution in game without oh, changing my Windows I desktop. Hate that. And that yeah. also, um, by extension, the fact that you don't have access to refresh rates. Uh, Dude, Windows has access to these things. Why can't the goddamn game have? I, I think so that what funny. Alex could probably relate to that used to annoy annoy me the most was Crisis when you would connect it to a screen and it would always want to do With 20, an HDMI 20, 20, yeah, 24, 24 hertz. hertz. You're like, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I, I I really want to know why that is because it only happens with the DX10 and yeah, DX10 version exactly. of Crisis, not with the DX9 what one. What's it it's, doing? It's totally, totally weird. You had to no, set up a, like that. a custom resolution, like I don't know, mm. nineteen twelve by ten eighty or something. That was yeah. And oh. under certain older versions of Windows, you could also Alt Tab multiple times in a row to get a full borderless full screen mode to appear. But it doesn't work in Windows eleven anymore. Or so I have no what idea. about those games that if you're using a TV as a monitor and it says, Oh, you're, we're just going to use 4096 by 2160. <laughs> yeah. That's the other thing It's it's basically using the native resolution. Um, of the yeah. did rather than the did. Yeah. Know, rather than the rather actual than panel. Screw you did. You're going to be using. There was actually a really funny bug. And I don't think I ever talked about it anywhere, but I, I said it off to four a games where, uh, the game, uh, as in Metro Exodus, I don't know if it happens with the Enhanced Edition. I don't recall, but it happened with the original release where the aspect ratio of the game would be 4096 by 2160, right. but it would render at 3840 by 2160. So everything would be like, I think, wider or is it taller? I can't recall. Um, but And I only noticed it when I went over to compare to the, the X- Xbox version. I was like, 
is this game's running at different FOVs? What's going on? It's like, no, the gun's just wider. <laughs> it's totally weird. Mm. Uh, but I don't think that's in the current version of Exodus. Or I guess the other pet peeve, pet peeve for me is when a PC game doesn't have the scalability options that the developer itself used for the console versions. Uh, yeah. <laughs> it's like, you know, okay, so you've made these series of changes and uh, presumably optimizations good. for your console version, but you're not going to give them to the PC guys. That's, that's nuts. You yeah. Know, makes no sense whatsoever. I mean, we could go on, but if you just go back to like January 2023, Alex did a video of 13 <laughs> things that are wrong with BT Kaylee. That all yeah. in there. <laughs> yeah, there, there's ones that we even kept out. And this is not a graphically related one, but the nested launcher thing, it's <laughs> becoming more and more relevant over yeah. time. Just mm. launching a launcher. Yeah. Um, okay. Good stuff. Let's move on to our next Launcher it into the sun. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> Next question, this one from Dudley the Gentleman. Now that we're in the year 2024, I'm having the number four on my mind, as you do. And speaking of the number four, what's up with Crisis 4? Though this right. is likely a title that will arrive well beyond 2024, <laughs> what are your hopes for the game, both visually and gameplay-wise? He's also got a completely separate question about whether uh, CD Projekt Red should uh, open source the Red Engine. But let's talk about Crisis yeah, 4, wow. first of all. Uh, John, what do you want from it? I would love for a game that is built in the spirit of Crisis 1, uh, but with modern sort of technology powering it. And by that, I mean not a, not an open world game still, but a game that presents large maps that present the player with multiple options uh, for completing your objectives. Um, basically take... You know, it's like Crisis combined with what like Arcane has done with like the Dishonored games to create sort of a hybrid of that. Uh, I want to be able to take on these large areas, explore, but do it my own way. And on top of that, I want to see this done with like cutting edge destruction features, because this is something that Crisis really pioneered in 2007. Uh, and even now, today, in the year of our Lord 2024... <laughs> Most games can't touch Crisis when it comes to this sort of thing. When you throw a grenade in a shack in Crisis, it just blows up everything. Like the, the roof pops off, the walls fall down, all the little objects either blow apart or roll around the level. That That's level awesome, of interactivity, man. like the scene, when you look at a scene before combat and then you look at that same scene after you've taken out enemies, provided you didn't do it stealth style, it's awesome. Like it's completely mm. different. That I, I want to see that taken to the next level, and I really hope that they're thinking about leveraging Crisis's strengths to create something that we just don't see much of these days. So, and visually, of course, I hope it's like Revenge of the Cry Engine, where they sort of <laughs> like focused inward, no more focusing on licensing this tech all around and trying to become the next Unreal Engine. That's that's dream is dead, it's not happening. Not happening. Yeah. That's not happening. Make anymore. this like super sick internal technology allow the, the the time and resources to really push the visuals out to the next level combine that with that destruction and that's what i want to see and that is a tall order but we'll see that sounds exactly like i would and there's and it's interesting because it's all about going back to the dna of crisis one at that point and i think some of the some of the niceties of the later series could crop in and i imagine they will crop in uh, for example, like with regards to suit modes, the chance of it not having a nano suit is like impossible. It's crisis. So imagine the way they'll do suit modes, though, is that it's going to have to be a cross platform game. And I do think they're going to do the the binaric binary suit modes, um, which I think is like a, a like a good and somewhat uh, like how do you call it like gameplay reduction simplification that allows it that's from the later parts of the series that doesn't go back to crisis one but still can be appropriate in the sandbox of crisis um i i also do hope like john that destruction is the big thing that they focus on regardless of everything else because games these days just still don't do it it is still not there it is not a gameplay feature when it is it's just a visual it's a visual nicety in crisis. It was actually like a gameplay feature, um, much like it was in red faction gorilla. Mm -hmm. So, so yeah, I want all that. And, uh, I think they should team up with NVIDIA to path trace this yes. game. Heck yeah. Do it. Yeah. Fair enough. Well, my thoughts on this, um, yeah, obviously we want to have the, the full fat experience. 
And uh, I think my worry would be that it would have to be a console game as well. Oh, yeah, I know. That's what I was mentioning about the yeah, I think that, you know, control. I think they should, and, and you know, I, I realise that this is commercial suicide, possibly. <laughs> <laughs> but I think they should make Crisis for a PC exclusive. The ultimate PC game. Come out in 20, 2025, 2026, and then port to the next-gen consoles in 28. Dude. And see, oh. just, just, just embrace the original crisis one ethos which was basically to target the state of the art in tech in gaming technology to produce the state of the art game maximum game i don't feel like maximum that would necessarily game. have to be commercial suicide either i feel like well, that would be to, a you selling just have point, to accept to separate absolutely them. but you'd have to accept that you know first of all you're going to need a really powerful pc yeah. um mm-hmm. and secondly that you know your return on investment a lot of it would be coming on later on in uh in the life cycle you know when the next generation right. consoles yes. appear which would presumably be able to cope with it but you know i just think that if you if you're doing crisis you've got to forget about scalability to a certain extent and just go for it to produce something game-changingly different like the original game was because you know what basically made crisis two and three more difficult to love was the fact that you know they were tied to a specific um uh, feature set which was defined by playstation 3 and xbox 360 Mm. and they could scale beyond that but ultimately that was that was the target right and um, that was a limiting factor on on the quality of, of the games that came out. And I just think Crisis 4 has got to be that one step beyond. And, you know, I think it would just be fantastic to have a game that people are excited about and uh, possibly thinking, well, yeah, I do need to upgrade. I guess the, the other thing is that the commercial realities are that right. you know, upgrading isn't as cheap as... As it used it to be. Used to be. Yeah. That said, eighty eight hundred GTX was a thousand dollar GPU. <laughs> <laughs> that ultra, yeah. Like people forget, like if you did upgrade for that time period, like the if you did upgrade around Crisis launch, it was an expensive upgrade actually. Yeah, like you, those things were not cheap at the time actually. Mm-hmm. Yeah, but that's that's my thoughts on it. I just think it's got to be as staggeringly ambitious as the original game, and maybe it's a pipe dream. But, but there we are. Actually, let's quickly talk about Pipe Dreams with Dudley the Gentleman's other question. Uh, with CDPR effectively abandoning their red engine, this brings to mind how important preservation is. He'd like CDPR to uh, take a note from id Software's playbook and open source the red engine. Though likely a pipe dream, what are the barriers that would prevent CDPR from going this route? Aren't they just leaving their in-house engine to languish? A good modding SDK for Cyberpunk 2077 would be great as well. Alex, I'm looking at I'm looking at online. I'm curious if like any of their middleware could not be open sourced as part of it, um, like the way they do trees or occlusion culling or audio i'm curious if those would be roadblocks from the license from when they originally used them to get them in the game to having it be open sourced but i think the rendering most of the rendering and all the gameplay code could easily be thrown out there uh they'd also have maybe issues with regard to open sourcing the uh the files that are used for characters Mm -hmm. um so like uh, Ken Reeves or any of the other people who were scanned into the game there could be aspects of privacy or whatever they assigned at that point in time uh, uh, but it could also be done in a in an id textile way where you can build the game without assets maybe and then you provide them yeah. there, I don't know there, I think there's routes to go forward there uh, that they could take and I would love to see them take it because if it is really going if it's really going goodbye completely after uh fandom liberty then i see no reason not to do it at this point people are just going to want to play cyberpunk forever why not give them the complete tools beyond beyond the modding tools at that Mm -hmm. point yeah anything sad on that one john no not really i agree with you what you guys said but yeah Mm. i'd like to see it 
Let's move on to our final question. This one from Adorably All, all Digital. Ooh. Mm. Um, here we go. Hypothetical for you. If you had one magic genie wish and you could either have Crisis 4 be every bit as legendary as game mm. and as game changing as Crisis yeah. 1 when it came out, or, or get a 10 out of 10 Turok remake with RE4 remake levels of care and maybe a bit of that System Shock remake magic, which would oh. you pick? Well, this is sort of seems to be targeting your fetishes. First, <laughs> yes, first and it foremost, is. Alex. <laughs> it's almost like a question was made for me. Well, I'm for me in terms of what was life defining. It was Crisis. Um, like it had much greater life effect. Defining. <laughs> Defi- life defining. I mean, it, it did put me on the path that I am on uh, today. So I would say I would, as much as I love to rock, which I really do. Um, I think it would be Crisis just because. Um, it would also it would have like a greater uh, I think industry reach at that point too. It would not just affect. My, I think Turok is so niche uh, that a lot of people really wouldn't get it, uh, even if it was an amazing remake, System Shock level. I think though, like what Crisis would do would be like a great invigorating thing to a lot of people who play PC games and who loved it for the reasons I did, which is a lot more people than that loved Turok. So I think that one's the good the good answer. Crisis. John? Also Crisis, 100%. I love Turok. Mm. I think it's fantastic. I think it would be easier to make a remake of it, though, And either way. But having Crisis 4 as an original game with the level of impact as, as Crisis 1, like, how could you not want that? That's what, what do you make of this Turok remake idea, though? It's uh, a secondary project. I feel like that... The thing about Turok is that it's, it's fundamentally like a... a very streamlined sort of game it's like a proto metroidvania kind of thing when you look at the way the levels work and how you're going back and forth and doing all that uh and i don't think it necessarily needs like a hyper realistic super detailed remake to be effective uh i would if if the if the comment was more would you like a 10 out of 10 re4 remake quality original Turok game Right. That's a very different conversation. But remaking Turok 1 with how that game is built, I just don't think it would actually benefit that much from that kind of visual overhaul. And like its original visual design is kind of part of its charm. And it's also what allows the level design to work. Because the level design can be pretty crazy in that, in terms of how mm-hmm. the pathways are laid out before you. And I think like making it more com- complicated might sort of ruin that to some degree. I don't know. Yeah, and it, like, how do you ex- justify like the pools of water in the clouds? It it just doesn't. It's, it's a like, very. It, it doesn't yeah, work. It doesn't. Right? It doesn't work with with realistic rendering conceptually. So, yeah, I agree with that. I, if I did see if I did see a Turok remake, I would want it to look actually like the box art, if you know what I mean. Like okay. in terms, of, it would look like red or like that CGI image I saw yes, from exactly. Turok Two the yes. other day. That would be fun. Oh, that that thing was d- <laughs> delicious. I could eat that. <laughs> wow. Okay, mm. well, that's it. That's the end of the show. That was the final question. So if you enjoyed it, please do like, subscribe, share, ring the bell for whatever uh, notifications may or may not come your way. <laughs> the Digital Foundry Supporter Program. Um, yeah, join us. Join our amazing community. Contribute to each and every DF Direct Weekly and get early access on that and a bunch of other early access stuff and bonus materials. There's so much going on there. Um, and yeah, store dot digitalfoundry.net for our various merchandising related wares but that's all from us for this week thanks for watching <laughs>